there was a secret chord that David played and he pleased the Lord. But you don't really care for music, do ya? It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall and the major lift, the baffled king composing hallelujah. helps a Christian become a better Christian, a Buddhist a better Buddhist, a person more optimistic, for we are all but different flavors of the immortal mystics. Potato, potato, amin, amen. But what do these phrases really mean? They mean, let it be, amin. Let it be that our world inhabitants be filled with that peace felt when first gazing upon your newborn child. Amen. Let it be that our political leaders look not to the fluorescence of asserting a powerful presence, but to the <coughs> dust clouds that the realities impose upon the lungs of our youth. Amen. Let it be that as we age, wrinkles emerge as evidence of a thousand facial expressions our skin cannot help but to remember. Hine matov. Umanaim, Shevetahim, Gam Yachad. 
Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And don't just tell me about how my life will be saved. Tell me about how Jesus, forgiving the murderer to his left, reminded you that maybe you could forgive the fact that your neighbor accidentally mowed over your flowers last month. I'll tell you how Bibi Khadija and her status as a woman business owner in 6th century Mecca makes me want my sister to grow strong and driven. How an emphasis on profit sharing of her interest is a reminder not to mindlessly seek to take back what is ours, but to rein our efforts into the collective sea of self-empowerment. Maslow step two. Let me drown in the rush of understanding Siddhartha Gautama felt as he experienced poverty for the first time, immortalizing his truths and paths in the Buddhist way. You're going to hell, they tell their unbelievers. Stop. Let us all here and now leave heaven and hell to the afterlife instead of cheapening it to our daily threats. But I cannot. There has to be a heaven because there must be a place for you to go. You who mutter a bless you to a sneeze across the room even though you know you won't be heard. You who get up on stages and spill your hearts and minds so that we may live through you, learn from you, and share in your cup that is rich and runs true. And for you who listen, speaking with your eyes instead, for you, I wish a heaven. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. journey in music began at age seven. I remember waiting impatiently for those intense Riyaz sessions. My biggest inspiration? My late father, Fez Muhammad Baloch, who was a phenomenal vocalist and musician. Jubilee Arts has opened up the floodgates of my past and demanded that a new chapter be written. My name is Zena Baloch, honored to represent the United States of America at the inaugural Jubilee Arts Festival. Tera naam sunkar aaya hu badi dur se Tera naam sunkar aaya hu badi dur se झोली मेरी भर दे मौला तू अपने नूर से ओ मौला ओ मौला ओ मौला मौला ओ मौला Maula, O Maula, Maula Maula Hey! 
As an Imam, we seek permission to submit a small memento as a token of the Canadian institution's loyalty and gratitude for Kodavin's benevolence and guidance. The gift, Hazar Imam, is a bronze sculpture by late Bill Reed, a famous Aboriginal artist. He named this sculpture the Bear Mother. The story of Bear Mother tells of the founding of Bear family within one of the Haida clan groupings. In the myth, it is the Bear Mother's role as a mother that gives meaning, and the focus of her existence is her children. In speaking about this sculpture, Bill Reed said, and I quote, the Bear Mother being human is looking into the future concerned more with her children than her legend. Kudavin, far be it for us to seek to make a comparison with a bare mother, but we feel that the underlying imagery of this piece of art symbolizes, even in a small measure, the Imam's love, warmth, nurturing, and protection of his murids.
And I have to say that as I look to the future, I have a deep sense of confidence that the Jamaat around the world is finding its position in the various countries, that our institutions are beginning to have an impact on the quality of life and the quality of thought and the quality of governance in the various countries where we are living. And I say to myself, that is due to what? It's due to your wisdom, your knowledge, your willing to help each other and to have the courage to think past crises because that ultimately is the nature of what we all have to do is to think past crises. Yali Madat, welcome. Bienvenue, Khushamadi. Thank you for joining us for another Friday Night Reflections. My name is Munira Premji and I am not a news reporter. I am a wife, a mum, a soon-to-be grandma, a proud vaccine recipient. I am also an HR practitioner, an author, and a cancer warrior with a huge bucket list. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of our Jamaati members, multi-faith family members, and everyone tuning in from across Canada and indeed from around the world. I am joining you from my home in Toronto with my chai and nan katai that my mom made especially for this occasion. I want you to know that hosting Friday Night Reflections is a dream come true for me. It's been on my bucket list for a year. Each week, my family and I tune in and we watch the show together. For us, it's about connection and community and great content and engaging, inspiring, and sometimes funny hosts. And one thing we love to do is to check out the physical backgrounds of the host and speakers, including President Saib's background. So it was game on for us. My husband and I had so much fun going through different parts of our home to find the right background for you. Now, I may not get a perfect uh, score on Room Raider, but I will try my very best to fill the big shoes of the gifted hosts that have come before me. I uh, hope uh, you enjoyed last week's episode with the talented Faruddin Hemani and other filmmakers and storytellers from our Jamaat. As I listened to Faradin talk about filming around the world, I just wanted to hop on a plane and travel to see family and friends. But COVID has made travel virtually impossible. I miss that. Through the pandemic, we have all experienced some form of loss, loss of work or business, loss of freedom as we try to be a parent and a teacher at the same time. Loss of not being able to go to Jamaat Khana or not being able to get together with a friend for a coffee or chai. And for a few of us, the loss has been devastating. Losing a loved one during this time and not being able to properly say goodbye. In Ontario, as in many parts of the country, we are now entering our third wave of infections. And with the appearance of variants and increasing infection rates, especially among younger people, we are not out of the woods yet. And we need to continue to be vigilant. Tonight's episode, though, is not about doom and gloom. Rather, it is about how we can accept our losses, find meaning from it, and with the strength of our faith, move forward confidently, not just through the promise of vaccines, but through the knowledge and certainty that Allah's divine grace is with us. This particular topic about grief and loss and hope has so much resonance for me. I was diagnosed with three advanced cancers in five years and went through tremendous losses, loss of identity, loss of financial independence, loss of purpose, loss of control over my body, loss of self-esteem. 
Yet here I am today with God's grace, living fully, hosting Friday Night Reflections. Today we will start with a message from Amir Ali Qasim Laka, President for the Council for Canada. We will then be joined by Alvaiza Parinda Chagani, who will provide reflections on understanding grief and finding hope in the context of our faith. I will engage with Alvaiza for a brief conversation after her presentation. Following that, I will share a little bit about my journey and what I went through. And we will also hear from Jamaati members sharing their experience of loss. We will then try something new. We will do a guided mindfulness activity. So please stay with us to the end. Just hang out with us for an hour. And then, as we always do, we will end this evening with wonderful musical expressions. But first, let's hear from President Amir Ali Qasim Laka. My dear brothers and sisters, I trust you and your families are keeping well. I would like to speak to you for a few minutes about the current state of the pandemic in Canada. According to Canadian public health officials, rapidly spreading variants of the COVID virus have significantly replaced the original virus in many parts of the country. There have been outbreaks of the UK, Brazilian, and the South African variants. In Canada, we are in a race between the spread of variants and the completion of vaccinations. The new variants are making younger people sicker, resulting in hospitalization. This requires greater vigilance on our part. Infection rates are high, and people who previously regarded themselves as less vulnerable to the virus are being impacted. We are in a serious third wave of the pandemic, and the government has appealed to younger people to stay at home. With the increasing rates, even younger adults in their 20s and 30s are requiring hospitalization. Many deteriorate quickly, require immediate admission, and require more time to recover in ICU, which is stressing hospital capacity. In some provinces, the number of patients in ICU are at the highest level since the pandemic began. Because the more transmissive variants of COVID are contributing to the spread, some provinces have considered or implemented stronger measures such as the stay-at-home order. My dear brothers and sisters, the variants are showing to be more transmissible than the original COVID strain. So, we request the Jamaat to please follow all protocols. When you can, stay at home. Unless it is essential, minimize activity outside of home. The next few weeks are crucial in our collective bid to slow the spread of the virus in Canada. I want to remind of Molana Hazimam's message to the Jamaat on Navroz. It is his wish that the Jamaat should avoid any complacency and every murid should continue exercising personal responsibility to ensure protection from the virus. Also, that all his murids should accept to be vaccinated in accordance with directives of health authorities as soon as vaccines are offered. Molana Hazrimam also guided that with the success in producing effective vaccines and other forms of treatment, societies around the world are looking with a sense of hope and optimism to emerging from the current COVID-19 pandemic. He conveyed his prayers for greater resilience, strength and unity in the Jamaat to overcome all forms of difficulty. Therefore, we can look forward with confidence. As the country navigates through the third wave, we request you again 
to be cautious. I know it has been a long and difficult period. We all feel this way. However, we are inshallah months away from completion of immunizations in Canada and therefore too close to let down our guard, risk our health and the health of those whom we love. So I urge you to take care of yourselves and to take good care of everyone in your family. Stay healthy and stay safe. Inshallah, there is light ahead. Thank you and Qudafiz. Thank you, President Saib, for your insights and reminder to exercise prudence and caution during this time. We are now going to turn to Alvaiza Parinda Chagani. Alvaiza is a graduate of the International Viazine Training Program and has been a Viazine for a decade. She has served as Chair of Focus Canada. She was Jamati Mukhani Saiba and IVC Captain. So her Seva runs deep. Professionally, she is a management consultant specializing in operational effectiveness and behavioral insights. She is joining us from beautiful Vancouver. Welcome, Alvaiza. Thank you, Munira. Ya Ali Madad. It's almost unbelievable that we are now in the second year of the pandemic. For over a year, we have had to grapple with the significant impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on our lives. The University of Manitoba recently conducted a survey that challenged participants to identify silver linings, if any, of the pandemic. More than 85% of the respondents identified at least one silver lining and yet, the pandemic has also brought changes that are not welcome. It has brought loss in many shapes and forms. Loss of jobs, loss of health, financial loss, loss of independence for some of us who have had to turn to family and friends for simple things like picking up groceries so that we can minimize health risks. Our Jamaat Khanas, around which our lives are centered, have not been accessible. And of course, during this time, many of us have also experienced the loss of loved ones. It has been a difficult time. Human nature is such that we resist change. It is difficult to let go, and therefore we may struggle with these losses. A common and normal reaction to experiencing loss is grief. Grief may be defined as the distress, the sadness, the pain that we feel when something that we value is taken away from us. And there are often emotional, physical, and mental reactions that accompany grief. And so grief may include intense emotions such as anger, fear, helplessness, sadness. And there may be physical symptoms such as tears, headaches, loss of appetite, or mental symptoms such as being unable to concentrate or forgetfulness. The more significant the relationship with who we have lost, the more intense are the reactions. And at times it may feel like the pain is simply unbearable. Grief is a normal part of life and it takes time to heal. So what are some coping strategies that may be helpful? Strategies such as simply let it happen rather than suppressing the feelings. It is okay if the tears come or if we feel sad. It is true that the grief journey is a lonely one, but it is also up to each person to decide 
just how lonely they will make it. And so another strategy is to use our support system, family, friends, support groups. These can be helpful when we need to talk or need help with practical things such as financial or official matters, rides, and so on. An important coping strategy is to look after ourselves from three dimensions, the body, the mind, and the soul. To look after the body means to eat healthy, get enough sleep. If we're having trouble sleeping, we might consider seeking some professional help. Looking after the mind, the mind and the body are connected. Exercise is a great way to manage stress, to provide some relief to the mind from the overwhelming emotions. Finding moments of relaxation, it is okay to laugh or to find joy in other areas of our lives. And caring for the spirit. How do we care for the spirit? The Holy Quran guides us on how to cope with loss, how to accept loss and find hope with patience, sabr, and submission. In the Holy Quran, prayer is enjoined upon the believer. In a letter attributed to Hazrat Ali alayhi salam, written to his son, Hazrat Hassan alayhi salam, the Imam explains about prayer to his son. He says, Think over it, that by simply granting you the privilege of praying for his favors and mercies, he has handed over the keys of his treasuries to you. Whenever you are in need, you should pray, and he will confer his bounties and blessings. In the Holy Quran, Allah assures us that he listens to our prayers. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, O Prophet, when my servants ask you about me, then tell them I am indeed very close. I answer the prayer of the supplicant who calls to me. And elsewhere in the Holy Quran, call upon me, I will respond to you. This word, call, I respond to those who call me and call upon me. This word, call, isn't simply remembering. When we remember someone, we bring that person's memory into our hearts, into our minds. But there isn't an action on the part of the person that we are remembering. But when we call someone, there is an underlying connotation of a response. And so Allah assures us in the Holy Quran that when we call, he responds. And so in our tradition, we have always turned to practice of the faith, to prayer, individual as well as congregational prayer, to seek peace and strength through difficulties. But with this pandemic, how we practice the faith has changed. We do not have access to Jamaat Khanas and to congregational prayers. For those of us who are dealing with loss, whether it is the loss of a loved one or a different kind of a loss, coping with the loss becomes more difficult as we have had to adjust to changes in the practices that we are used to, from which we draw comfort. Families and friends who are often pillars of strength at a time of loss are unable to be together to support each other. We are unable to participate in as large numbers in congregational prayer as we used to. And all these changes can be unsettling. But let us remind ourselves of what is the essence of prayer. And let us do that through the lovely story of Prophet Musa and the shepherd. 
Prophet Musa came upon a shepherd. The shepherd was calling upon God. Where are you, O God? I want to be your servant. I want to comb your hair and remove the lice from it. I want to wash your clothes and bring milk to you. I want to rub your little foot, and so on. Prophet Musa was offended. He said to the shepherd, How can you speak in this way to the one who created you, the one who created the earth and the sky? Indeed, you have not submitted to Allah. You have become an infidel. The shepherd was devastated at what he had done. O oh, Moses, he said, you have closed my mouth and you have burned my soul with repentance. And then a revelation came to Moses from God. You have parted my servant from me. I look not at the tongue and the speech. I look at the inward spirit and the feeling. I gaze into the heart. What does this story tell us? It speaks to the how we practice. In the shepherd's case, how he prayed, that is the words that he used, that is what offended Prophet Musa. But the revelation to Prophet Musa tells us that Allah looks not at how one prays, Allah looks at the heart, the sincerity, the humility, and very importantly, the niyat, the intention. This story tells us that niyat is fundamental. It is the central principle that underpins all our practices. And so at this time of the pandemic, while we are unable to undertake all the practices as we traditionally did in the Jamaat Khana space, in large gatherings and so on, the example of the shepherd reminds us that individual prayers are powerful. The shepherd was praying in the fields surrounded by his flock. He wasn't praying in a formalized way or in a traditional space of worship or in a congregation. If we look in our history, we find examples of jamaats in areas where there were no jamaat khanas for various reasons and the Jamaat practiced in their homes. And so we see that niyat and sincerity, love and devotion, these are the essential elements of prayer. And so during this pandemic, we need not fear that our prayers are any the less because of the changes in our practices. Rather, we must focus on Allah's infinite mercy and compassion and submit our prayers with conviction that he will accept our prayers. Additionally, let us remind ourselves of Maulana Hazar Imam Stalika Mubarak in December 2020. Maulana Hazar Imam Salvatullah alayhi said, It is a matter of satisfaction that my Jamaat continues to draw inspiration from our historic tradition of facing adversity with unity, resolve, and resilience. I believe my Jamaat will find comfort and support from the practice of their faith, whether in Jamaat Khanas, where these are accessible, or by way of private, personal prayer. Private, personal prayer. And so though we miss attending Jamaat Khanas, we miss the experience of praying together as a Jamaat. Nonetheless, we can continue to offer our prayers at home with pure niyat, with full engagement of the heart to draw comfort and courage and strength. In that same letter that I mentioned earlier, Hazrat Ali alayhi salam speaks to his son, Hazrat Hassan alayhi salam, about prayer, about personal prayer, in very beautiful, inspirational words. He says, He hears you whenever you call him. 
He accepts your prayer whenever you pray to him. Invoke him to grant you your heart's desire. Lay before him the secrets of your heart. Tell him about all the calamities that have befallen you and misfortunes which face you and beseech his help to overcome them. You may invoke his help and support in difficulties and distresses. Just as the shepherd spoke from his heart, expressing his love and devotion, so we can, in our own way, tell him how we feel, what's in our hearts, and seek his help and support through the difficult journey of grief. Experiencing loss is always painful, and experiencing the loss of a loved one is often a deeply traumatic event for the family. Experiences in life offer opportunity for growth, for self-development, especially the painful and difficult ones. It is said that grief is a teacher. Let us reflect upon some learnings that we can draw from the experience of loss. Life is fragile. Life is short. Things don't always make sense. Sometimes the answer to our why is that there is no answer. Living through loss, living through instability, makes us think about what we can count on. We can count on the relationships we have. And so another learning is to treasure the time that we have with our loved ones. And to think of practical ways to do this, like not going to sleep without expressing your love, your joy, your gratitude to your loved ones. Remember, this moment will not come again. We can count on the values we have, putting those values into action. For example, making sure that no day goes by without kindness and compassion to others. The last year has been difficult for everyone. Even a small gesture of kindness can have a huge impact on someone's well-being. Another learning is to strive for balance, even in sad times. Yes, there is loss. At the same time, there are many blessings in our lives. So try to smile, to laugh. Remember, a smile itself is a blessing. An important learning is to mend fences if they are in disrepair. It will be part of what we leave behind. So there are many learnings from the experience of grief because it cannot be, it mustn't be for nothing that we go through this pain. Of all the lessons that grief teaches us, perhaps the most powerful is articulated by Imam Mustansir Bilal salam in the Pandiyati Jawan Mardi. Imam says, Whomsoever you love in this world will be ultimately separated from you by death, causing you grief. Therefore, it is necessary for you to develop affection for someone who will be with you both in this world and in the hereafter, who never disappears, who is nearer to you than anyone, nay, nearer even than your very self. Here our Imam speaks to the necessity of an eternal relationship a bond which goes beyond the physical life. And he guides us to the importance of nurturing and strengthening that bond throughout our lifetime, through prayer, remembrance, ibadat, service. And as we go through this journey of loss and pain, we can remember that our Imam is with us. Imam's chatra chaya, his blessings, his love, all of this 
is an integral part of our lives. Let me conclude with Maulana Hazar Imam's heartwarming message at the beginning of the pandemic. Maulana Hazar Imam Salvatullah said, Please convey my best paternal and my best maternal loving blessings to my worldwide Jamaat and tell them that I think of them every minute of the day, each day, and I pray for Mushkil Hassan and for their peace and happiness. Shukran Lilla. Thank you. Thank you, Alvaiza, for going deep into the topic of grief and loss and hope. And as you were speaking, I was furiously taking some notes because I have so many questions to ask you. My first question is, I uh, love the way you positioned your presentation to say that through the pandemic, we have experienced many losses and this has also been a time of welcome changes. So my question from, for you from a place of vulnerability is, what is one loss you have personally experienced and one gift uh, from the pandemic? Oh goodness, yes. We've all experienced loss in some way. Perhaps what I have found particularly difficult is the loss of freedom. Freedom to do the things that I want to do. Freedom to go have coffee with my friends. Freedom to celebrate festivals and special occasions as we used to. Freedom to travel so that I can go see our son and daughter-in-law who live abroad. And yes, our family has also experienced a significant loss of a dear family member just last week. But as you say, there are also welcome changes. And for me, I would say that time is one of those. Having the time to do the things that I didn't have time to do before. So around the time that the pandemic started, we watched The Queen's Gambit. And that inspired me to dust off the chess set sitting in the basement and to start using it. And it's been so much fun. And when my brain's tired of that, I switch to my delightful 1000 piece jigsaw puzzle. And that is great too, although it's going rather slow. You know, I think a lot of us can relate to the loss of freedom that you talk about. And it's great that you rediscovered your passion for jigsaw puzzles and uh, chess and The Queen's Gambit, great movie. Thank you for that. Um, you uh, mention something that I found really quite interesting, that human beings are resistant to change. Um, you also described the emotional, physical, and mental reactions that accompany grief. Um, how is this connected, Alvaiza, and how is grief showing up in our Jamaat? This is a great question, Munira. Human nature is such that letting go is difficult. Throughout our lives, we are conditioned to gather, to collect, because that accumulation defines us in the physical life. It's part of our identity. I am a mother, I am a father, I have this home, I have this car, I have three children and so on. And so we gather and letting go isn't easy because it chips away at that identity that we may have built and it makes us feel vulnerable. And with loss, we have no option but to let go. And so we grieve. Grieving is very personal. Each one of us is unique so each person grieves differently. There isn't a standard or a typical way because there is no standard or typical loss. Some of us want to be alone at this time. Some of us can't be alone and need to connect with others. And of course, there are many emotions that can accompany grief. Sadness, sometimes guilt or anger. Why did this happen to me? Questions may arise about our core beliefs, and often we search for meaning. We may turn inwards 
in this quest for meaning. We turn to the faith for answers to help us make sense of what's happened. Yeah, letting go can be just so, so, so hard. And uh, I love how you defined change and loss because loss requires that we let go of things. I just love the way that you brought that together. And I also loved um, how you talked about the fact that grieving is personal. There is no one way to grieve. Um, it is so individual, and, and I think that will bring a lot of comfort to people. Um, when you talk about dealing with loss, um, you speak of sabr, and this is a word that I hear very often from my 90-year-old mom, who will always say to me, sabr rak. <laughs> And I would love for you to elaborate more on the notion of sabr. Thank you for asking this question. It's a question that often arises in our minds. Sabr means patience. And this word appears in the Holy Quran many, many times. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah speaks of tests that he sets for us. He speaks of loss and of the importance of facing loss with patience, with sabr. So why is patience important in the face of difficulties and trials? The Holy Quran repeatedly declares that all things in this world have been made in paired opposites. There is light, there is dark. There is the temporary life of this world, dunya, and the eternal life hereafter, the akhira. There is happiness and there is sadness. And the idea is that as believers, we trust Allah at all times, through good times and difficult times. And so it can be suggested that in, even in difficult times, or perhaps especially in difficult times, we can turn to Allah with absolute submission to His will, with full trust in Allah's mercy and grace, with full trust that Allah is good and that He will pull us through this difficult time. So these are the sentiments that underlie the notion of patience. It is this trust in Allah that gives us the strength to be patient through the difficult times. And when we are patient, Allah tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah that those who are patient Upon them descend blessings from Allah and mercy from Allah. Hmm. Thank you for that. Patience is certainly not something that comes easy to me. <laughs> but after hearing you, I, I see how you take the notion of patience and really intertwine that with trust in Allah. And um, I, th I think that's a really fantastic message. Um, you make reference in your presentation to um, the letter that Hazrat Ali wrote to his son, Hazrat Hassan, when he said, and I quote, uh, whenever you're in need, you should pray and he will confer his bounties and blessings. There is something so inherently comforting in those words. Indeed. In fact, Hazrat Ali alayhi salam, describes prayer as a privilege. And he describes it as the key to Allah's treasuries. Imagine having that key. And so if we pray with pure niyat, with full submission, with complete trust and conviction in Allah's grace and rahmah, imagine how powerful prayer can be. Your reference to the teachings of uh... Imam Mustan Sirbila was very powerful. I hadn't heard that before. I know from speaking with you that this particular teaching has a lot of resonance for you. Um, can you highlight the essence of that particular teaching, please? Yes. The Imam reminds us in very simple terms that the physical life and all that it offers is finite. Mm -hmm. And hence, the day, there will come a day when all of this will end. 
And therefore, there is the need for a permanent bond, a bond with someone who will always be with us, who never leaves us. And this, of course, is a spiritual bond, for only the spiritual life is eternal. And so the Imam reminds us of the importance of nurturing this spiritual bond. To me, this highlights the importance of balance in our lives between din and dunya. And it gives comfort that with this spiritual bond, we are never alone, not in this life, not in the hereafter. What a wonderful place to stop, uh, Alvaiza. You have been so generous with your time. Um, you have uh, helped me certainly, and I know that I speak on behalf of a lot of people, helped us really see grief, hope, loss in a very different way. And uh, I just really want to thank you for making the time to, to deliver a really deep uh, reflection on this topic. Thank you, Alvaiza. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honor. Thank you. Listening to Alvaiza brought back a lot of memories for me. When I was first diagnosed with the cancers, I went through the different stages of grief that Kubler-Ross, a psychologist, describes. Denial that this was happening to me. Anger that the life I had planned for myself was no longer possible because I was living on borrowed time. Depression when I needed help with the smallest things like even getting out of bed. Bargaining with anyone and everyone to survive day to day. And then one day I totally surrendered to God's will and said, okay, you are the master producer, the choreographer, the director. You know the plan, I don't. I have no control over this. I submit to you completely and joyfully. That's when I knew I had gotten to acceptance. The stages in this model are not linear. Sometimes we will go back and forth, back and forth between stages. And with every loss, we go through the cycle again. I know I did. The reason I want to share this with you is because if you are going through challenges as so many of us are during COVID, and if you're feeling emotions like sadness or anger, that's okay. You're allowed. It's part of the human condition. It's part of the grieving process that Alvaiza talked about. The key though is to let go of what you can't control. Because when you intentionally accept what is rather than what you want it to be, something shifts and you make space for change and for healing. You know, it's only when I finally leaned into acceptance and it took me a while to get there that the world opened up for me again. I wrote a book. I started working again. I became a podcast host. I started to volunteer for causes that are important to me. I even learned to cook finally. And I am joyfully crossing things off from my bucket list one at a time and living on purpose. So during this challenging time, accept and embrace all the feelings you are going through. Try and find meaning in your losses and move confidently in the direction of your dreams. You can so do this. On March 27th, 2020, I lost my mom. She passed away from cancer. She died four days after receiving the diagnosis. Because of COVID-19, we were not able to be with her in the hospital. This was a really challenging and shocking time for our family. We weren't able to gather in Jamaat Khanna. We weren't able to gather as a family. But with Zoom, we were able to talk to each other, share happy stories about my mom, share memories about my mom. We also looked towards our faith for help and support. And praying on a daily basis really helped us get through this most difficult time. 
It was also really great for me to talk to my sister Farin every day and talk to her about my mom and share her stories with my mom and for her to share her stories and for our children to talk about their stories about their grandmother. That was very special for us. So while it was really difficult during COVID-19 to lose somebody, we found great strength within each other and within our faith. And that's how we were able to cope during this time. Losing a dear one is very hard. I was not ready for this. It hit me hard with a lot of emotions and questions. I felt lonely and helpless. I would question myself, why me? Why one of my loved ones? What I could have done to prevent the situation. But with time, I realized that all this questioning wouldn't change it. So I had to accept it and change my perspective by asking for help. We are so lucky and blessed as a community. We have all this help ready for us. So I called the chairperson of Help Board and they were there for me. They would take their time, listen to me, make follow-ups and put me in contact with professionals if I need it. I remind myself I have my family, my relatives and my friends and I want to be there for them. In order to be able to do that, I have to take care of myself, take care of my physical and mental health. So my advice for anyone going through this kind of situation is not to be afraid or shy to ask for help, to surround yourself with good and positive people, to accept it and to forgive yourself. And more important, to be able to move on. To move on does not mean to forget, but to keep the good memories with you. We lost our father and our grandmother during this current pandemic. Our father passed away in December over the Christmas holidays of 2020 and our grandmother a couple of months later. Um, obviously, losing somebody, whether it's a pandemic or not, is very difficult. However, the pandemic really didn't allow us to grieve the normal way we're used to when somebody close to us passes away. Um, being in complete lockdown when um, they passed away meant no one was allowed to your house. Uh, we couldn't get together with our family members physically. Jamaat Khan was closed. Um, so it really wears on you and it takes a toll, you know, because that's how we were used to grieving. Um, unfortunately, um, our hands were tied and, and we had to grieve in different ways. Um, I don't think there's a correct way or a right or a wrong way to grieve. Um, but what we did as a family was we, we made sure that we got together every night um, after dad passed away and after our grandmother passed away and prayed together at a certain time and set up a Zoom call that we were all together um, for that time after, after they passed away. And that's still ongoing. And there may be times when you want to grieve alone too. Um, I think at this time too, you should also celebrate, celebrate the lives of your loved ones as well. Um, I know that my father had done so much for the community and it helps us um, really grieve and, and celebrate the good times knowing um, that, you know, he'd led such a good life. And for my grandmother, I mean, she, she was 95 years old and she led a great life too. Um, sometimes you need to dwell on the positives more so than the negatives. However, keeping in constant communication with your family, keeping in constant communication with your friends, um, talking about it to people over the phone. I know it's not the same as being in person, but these small things do help along the way. Um, it's definitely a process. Every day is different. Um, some days you wake up okay and some days you won't. Um, but it's a process that you have to go through. Um, it's definitely not easy. Um, but I really think a communication, staying close with your loved ones, talking to them all the time is one of the, the most important ways you can uh, keep together and get through such uh, difficult times. In speaking to loss, I lost my dad to cancer on October 5th, and this was just one month before his 57th birthday. And it was one of the most painful experiences that has permanently changed me and my family. 
Despite a global pandemic, and granted at that time there were looser restrictions, we had an outpouring of love and support from family and friends who stood by our side throughout the entire process. What was unexpected during this time was a role that the Mayid and Gusl team played in the process of healing and also assisting with the last rites and ceremonies, no matter what time I called them, including the Jamaati leadership team, they were always a phone call away. The Jamaati leadership team and the Jamaati members were also an anchor as they enveloped us in their love and support and really went above and beyond to provide that support. It made me extremely thankful to be an Ismaili. Now each family member goes through a loss differently. And I learned this early on that it's important to support your family members through their grief process and support them through their journey as they did with me. My dad had trained us right from the beginning when we were kids to know that death is not the end. And there's much more to see once the soul is released from the worldly form. I know that he's happy wherever he is, but the question still comes up initially. Why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to my family? And why do I have to suffer this pain? And for that answer, I remember Sultan Muhammad Shah's Farman, where he says struggle is the meaning of life. We all have problems that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and some of these problems will be much more difficult to cope with than others. However, it's important to develop a healthy coping strategy and allow yourself to be open to receiving support from friends and family. My coping strategy was my faith, and at a time when I can't go to Jamaat Khana, personal prayer and reflection was key. We as humans are extremely resilient. My dad's loss will never be easier. Despite what people say that it gets easier day by day, what does happen though is that you learn to cope better day by day. And inshallah, for anyone that is experiencing loss or has experienced loss, you are able to find your coping strategy to help you during your struggle. In June 2020, I lost my dearest brother, Garim Gwazi. Losing a family member in any circumstances is difficult. Losing a family member during the global pandemic was traumatic. The inability to attend Jamaat Khane, to perform the rituals needed, or following public health measures and not being able to hug your loved ones made it very, very challenging. In my opinion, I felt that those two elements were needed to overcome grief. Some of the methods that I used in overcoming grief was reaching out more to family, sharing stories, sharing laughter, sharing experiences, which helped considerably. Then reaching out to our British Columbia Muki Gamera Saibs and Mukiani Gamera Saibas and our Alwises. Those groups combined are a wealth of information and of hope, and that was what they infused in me. Being part of a volunteer community exposed me to other groups that continue to carry me through this time, which I'm very, very blessed. Finally, being in BC, we are blessed to have a lot of trails, and I would walk and I still do every single day as a way of connecting with nature and connecting with Allah. And that too has become a source of inspiration for me. In this part of Friday Night Reflections, we're going to try something new. We are going to do a mindfulness activity. And I would love it if you could all, everyone watching, participate with me. The purpose of this short reflection and associated mindfulness exercise is to provide grieving individuals and families with an opportunity for emotional and spiritual comfort and solace, enabling them to draw on their inner strength. In some Muslim contexts or societies, 
Mindfulness is viewed in reference to al muraqaba a conscious state of awareness of Allah, including our inner states in relation to Him. As the quran sharif states in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayat 235, Remember that God knows what is in your souls, so be mindful of Him. Amongst Shia and most Muslim mystical traditions, Hazrat Ali alayhi salam is regarded as the foremost spiritual guide after Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. For Shia Ismaili Muslims, a conscious state of awareness also includes the awareness of our permanent spiritual bond with our beloved Mawlana Hazrat Imam at all times and wherever we are as well as the role of our Imam as Mushkil Kusha, remover of difficulties. Mindfulness can be thought of as an aspect of this conscious awareness and provides an opportunity to create a space to observe and to be present with ourselves and our emotions without judgment. This enables us to work towards acceptance and letting go of the tension and thoughts that may be intensifying our pain. This is not necessarily about changing the way we feel, but instead changing how we perceive such feelings. By taking an approach rooted in our faith, we can help our souls as well as our minds and bodies to heal. Inshallah, over time, we can find a sense of inner peace. In this exercise, the remembrance of Allah through dhikr or a tasbih can act as an anchor and at the same time help us feel protected and supported as we seek to draw strength from our spiritual bond with Imam Zaman. We hope that this results in enhanced physical, emotional and spiritual health and over time in greater resilience when faced with loss or grief. If, however, you are finding it difficult to manage on your own or are having particularly uncomfortable sensations after engaging in this exercise, please seek professional and or spiritual support. Let us begin to work through the grief we are experiencing by engaging in a reflection and mindfulness exercise. By remembering Allah and allowing ourselves to be present with our emotions, thoughts and sensations, we can begin to process and accept our grief and ultimately move towards healing. Begin by settling into a comfortable position. This could be sitting, standing or reclining. If you are sitting, place your feet on the floor. Find a comfortable posture and relax your shoulders. Gently close your eyes or simply lower your gaze and focus your attention inwards. Use this moment to be present and notice what is happening in the here and now. What thoughts are going through your mind? Is your mind racing or calm? What are you feeling? The pain of your loss may be present with you. You may be experiencing anger, sadness, despair, or any other emotions. Perhaps you aren't feeling anything at all right now. Allow yourself to simply observe your feelings, thoughts and sensations without judgment. Whatever you feel in this moment is completely okay. You may find it helpful to anchor your mindfulness in a dhikr or a tasbih. You may choose to draw upon Ya Allah, Ya Muhammad, 
Ya Ali, or any of the beautiful names of Allah, or simply the Salawat. Now bring your awareness to your breath. Allow yourself to breathe naturally. Inhale smoothly through your nose and exhale slowly through your mouth. As you inhale, notice the air moving in through your nose and down into your stomach. As you exhale, gently release the air. It is natural for thoughts and feelings to come into your mind during this time. Allow them to come and go without judgment and return your attention to the breath. As you breathe, allow the dhikr you have chosen to move through your body. Breathe in and out, in and out. As you focus on your natural relaxed breathing, become aware of how the air moves through your body, helping to nourish you. Feel the life and energy Allah has given you throughout your body. Allow that energy to build within you a deep sense of gratitude to Allah for your breath, your living and your being in this moment. Consider that the eternal spark within you, your soul, comes from Allah and will return back to its origin to rest in eternal peace. As you settle into stillness within your inner space, begin to perceive the feeling of being aware of Mawla. Know and feel that Mawla is with you now and at all times. He is always with you. Mawla's grace knows no limits and his compassion knows no bounds. Mawla's love for you and for those you love is endless and encompassing. Allow yourself to contemplate that Mawla's love and blessings are always with you. Let that love fill you with a sense of protection and peace. Spend time with this and let those feelings gradually deepen with each breath, in and out, in and out. As you are present in this moment, your mind may wander. You may become distracted. Thoughts of pain and suffering may return. This is natural. When you notice your attention wandering, simply acknowledge it without judgment and gently bring your awareness back to being present with your dhikr. Allow your dhikr to anchor your breathing. Remember, it is natural for thoughts and feelings to come into your mind during this time. Simply use your dhikr to return to a state of mindfulness. Continue to focus on being present with Mawla. Know and feel that Mawla is always with you. Mawla's grace knows no limits and his compassion knows no bounds. Continue breathing in and out. In and out. Stay in this mindful state for as long as you like. When you are ready, slowly open your eyes and bring your attention back to your surroundings. Let us end this reflection with Surah Ad-Duha and with Nade Ali. Surah Ad-Duha came to our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam during one of his most challenging moments as a reminder of Allah's love and grace. As you hear its opening verses, may it be a reminder to you 
of the same presence in your own life. By the morning brightness and by the night when it grows still, your Lord has not forsaken you, nor does he hate you, and the future will be better for you than the past. Your Lord is sure to give you so much that you will be well satisfied. A well-known prayer in Muslim tradition is Nade Ali. It is recited by believers in times of difficulty and invokes the help of Hazrat Ali alayhi salam. Nade Ali, Nade Ali, Nade Aliyan, Mazharal Ajaib, Tajid Duhu Aunan Lakafin Nawaib, Kuluhamin, Wagamin, Sayanjali Bivilayatika, Ya Ali, Ya Ali, Ya Ali. Call Ali, call Ali, call Ali the manifester of wonders. You will surely find him helping you in your troubles. All grief and sorrow shall disappear by your authority, O Ali, O Ali, O Ali. Thank you for joining us this week. It has been an absolute pleasure being your host. You know, it takes a small and mighty team of volunteers to put together Friday Night Reflections every week. And I just want to commend all the people that work behind the scenes to make this happen. You guys rock. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, and enjoy the musical expressions coming up. Following the battle, look in many eyes Knew it wasn't over, we could celebrate the night Hush my babies, don't you cry Don't look like me, but I'm here inside Sit and burn a candle on both ends every night Falling down and getting up, learning a new life Life of a survivor, facing new desires Won't sit down, gotta ignite it Holding on, it's a bad enough, but I'm not giving up On my darkest days of love will hold me up I survive, and I choose how I've come this far, I wanna see what's next I'm not a letting go If I don't wake up tomorrow, I got no regrets, so I choose Count the blessings till my very last breath Wear the scar so proudly, devote me to my life If I stand for something, maybe I can heal my tribe Daring greatly to feel this fire Solid faith when reality lies What happens in the darkness when fear and pain collide Find the guiding light, stand for all who can fight Yes, we can break boundaries, no one won't stay silent Be the change I wanna see Holding on, it's so bad enough but I'm not giving up oh my Harder